name's Tom Walker. Welcome to That'll Be The Day. In this podcast, I'm going to be talking to an Australian man who, after a climbing accident, became seriously disabled, which includes losing his sight. But before we hear from Dave Conway, if you like the music at the start of this podcast, it's a track called That'll Be The Day by the Liverpool band The Vow. And as always, at the end of my podcasts, I'll be featuring a track by The Vow, which may include a familiar voice. Stay tuned to find out which one it is. Now, in February 2004, Dave Conway from Queensland was out climbing with a friend when he fell some 20 metres. As a result, he sustained a number of serious injuries that have resulted in him using a wheelchair and, as they say in certain parts of the world, being legally blind. It's an amazing story and Dave is on the other end of this Zoom call now from Australia. Dave, how's it going? I'm great, thank you. How's the lockdown been for you, Dave? Absolutely great. I live in central Queensland. We've only had one lockdown that lasted about two months, which was last year. So where I live, it's very minimal. We don't have many active cases. We're very lucky because we're just a regional town slash city. So we don't have lockdowns like the metropolitan cities do. Does that mean you were able to get out and about largely? Yes, I can get out and about most days. Tell me about your life now, Dave. What are you up to? Well, I'm now an artist. I do a lot of community work. I really enjoy helping out. Today, I did a bit of work at the local library, helping people with some information with the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is Australia's disability scheme, where it means that people who have or get a disability through accident or birth they are able to access care and support so that they can move on and live a better life if you don't mind dave tell me about the disabilities you have so i am a wheelchair user as i am a paraplegic because i smashed my spine at my chest level i also am legally blind because i also damaged my optic nerves and i'm also on a lot of medication because I smashed my pituitary gland in my accident. And before we started recording, we were both uh, talking about using access technology and we both use JAWS, don't we? Yes, we do. And it's an amazing tool, really helps with my independence. Tell me about how you became disabled, Dave, because uh, you were what I would call an extreme athlete. Is that right? Yes, it is. I was an extreme athlete. I was a rock climber mountain biker, you name it, I probably did it. On the 19th of February 2004, I was out climbing with a climbing partner of mine. I had a climbing fall from about 20 metres, whereby I hit my back on a ledge three metres from the ground and I landed on my head and left shoulder. I then spent 22 days in intensive care. Of those days, I spent 17 in a coma. When I woke up, I couldn't talk because I had a breathing tube in and I was totally blind. I spent 15 months in the hospital. Through that time, I did almost die three times in that coma. And when I was out of that, my parents who flew down to Brisbane from Mackay, where I was studying to be with me and my brother deferred university, my sister stayed in Mackay. When they were able to take me out, to the canteen and explain everything that happened to me. I just grabbed life with both hands because I knew how lucky I was to be here. How did you get into being an extreme athlete? What sort of motivated you? What inspired you to do it? Well, I've been always into alternative sports because I got into mountain biking when I was younger. Always enjoyed the rush. Love rock climbing. I was a climber for about five years before my accident. Got into that, really enjoyed because every climb was a different challenge, different techniques and different climbing apparatus needed. So every climb was always different, a different challenge on every day. Even at, at the same climb would be a different challenge from day to day, depending on how you're feeling and what you're up to. What level were you at, Dave? Were you quite well known in Australia or was it just a private thing? I was just a private thing. I suppose I had my accident before. Facebook and before YouTube. So I just did what I did because I loved it. I was training to compete in the extreme games when I had my accident 
So I was meant to go overseas to America to compete. But hey, life stepped in the way, but life's great these days. Did you ever contemplate the possibility of an accident or was it just far from your mind? Uh, yes, I did. I did contemplate that because there was a movie released about six months before my accident where I really wish I could remember the name of it. There was a climbing scene at the start and this was like in Moab in America where these cliffs are like hundreds of metres tall and there was an accident at the start of the movie with the father and the son and daughter then go on to be the main characters of the movie. I totally accepted an accident could happen to me. I knew the risks. I was a surfer. As I said to people, I know there are sharks out there. That is one of the risks I have with surfing. Falls is one of the risks I have with climbing. You have to accept what you're doing before you get into it, especially with the sports I was doing. So you spent 22 days in intensive care. Um, you started, I presume, to regain consciousness and awareness of what happened to you. Is that Does that broadly describe how things worked out? Yes. What were your thoughts as you began to fully appreciate the magnitude of what happened to you? I was just so grateful to be alive still. When I woke up in intensive care, that was on the day I had surgery on my back, so... They brought me to and took me through a lot of stuff, then had surgery for about 12 hours on my back because that diffused my spine. After that, I couldn't talk because I had a breathing tube in and I couldn't see because I was totally blind. So how I communicated was through holding a person's hand, I would squeeze once if I understood and twice if I didn't understand what they were saying. And then when I got out of intensive care, I was able to get that breathing tube removed and then talk properly again and yeah just grab life with both hands it changed me in many ways changed me from who I was to who I am I'm, re I'm very grateful that part because I I'm still here my mum my dad my brother and sister are probably very grateful that I'm still here as it was very touch and go in the start Tell me, Dave, if you would about the process of rehabilitation what did you have to go through so rehabilitation for me was delayed a bit because the pituitary gland damage I have, I had to have all my hormones and everything restabilized with medications, which is an ongoing process. I still get regular blood tests, but that medication keeps me alive, so that's all right. So I spent about eight months in the neurology ward in the PA hospital before I got to the spinal unit. And... In that time, they were stabilizing my hormones. They also had to deal with my back wound on from where they stabilized my spine. It was a very interesting challenge that they had. One of the medications that was keeping me alive, hydrocortisone, which is for my adrenal gland, which is underactive these days, was actually causing the wound on my back to break down. So then they had to do alternative ways of healing it. So long story short, took about eight months for the scar on my back to be totally healed. And then I got to the spinal unit. The spinal unit at the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Um, so when I got there, I had to learn how to start my daily routine. I had to learn how to get in and out of bed. For me, the spinal unit was very different to the standard person in my situation with the same level of spinal injury as my spinal doctor said to me I was the only person he'd seen through the spinal unit in his time that had vision impairment and spinal injury because of their accident so the standard cooking driving all those sort of things were just off the cards so they had to the therapist had to find other ways that could help me which they did, and I was really grateful for. And presumably when you got home, um, the house had to be completely changed, adapted to uh, enable you to cope with the various challenges of your disability. Yes, and in saying that, I'm very fortunate I was able to go home. The unfortunate part was when I was in hospital, that was before 
the NDIS was around in Australia, because it's only been around for the last five years, I was offered no help from the government, but I'm very fortunate to have an amazing family who stepped up. They cared for me for about three years. I moved home, mum and dad, while I was in hospital, converted their spare bathroom and laundry into an accessible bathroom. And we were lucky that we that's all we had to do apart from a while later, make a ramp at the front door. We had a ramp going out the back door, so that worked. We just had to go around the back every time we left the house. What would the alternative have been, Dave, had your parents not been able to step in to help? I know exactly what that would have been because my parents were told that. If my parents didn't step in to help, they were actually told I would probably stay in hospital, if not move to a nursing home. One of the earliest memories I have is my dad talking to me in intensive care after my neurologist did a lot of testing on me. The pituitary gland damage I have is classified as an acquired brain injury as it is in the brain and it's an injury. So after the neurologist did a lot of testing on me, they could verify that I had no cognitive, no intellectual or no mental side effects of the acquired brain injury. Dad said that was the best thing he was ever told. He also said that he could accept my accident because I was doing something I loved. I was going to ask you about that, Dave. Was there ever a moment when your parents or anybody else said to you, if only, Dave, you hadn't got into this extreme sport thing, you know, it, it, perhaps you could have played football or rugby or something, you'd have been, you wouldn't have had this disability. Did anybody ever say anything like that to you? Yeah, lots of people have said things like that to me. I've said to them, well, I wouldn't be in the situation I am today. My life is good. I have a lot of good people around me. I have good quality of life. And also I say to them, well, if rugby is such a safe sport, why do I know two people in wheelchairs that have had scrums collapse on them and they've got broken necks? So basically what you're saying is that accidents can happen anywhere, really, and you may as well oh. have an accident doing what, doing what you enjoy doing. Oh, totally. And one of the things that really made me realise accidents can happen anywhere was meeting an older lady. She mopped her house and went, sat outside, her landline phone rang, so she ran back in to get it. She slipped on her floor and broke her neck. I realised then and there, accidents can happen at any point in our lives, and we just have to make the most of it. As you reflect on your life now, and you've told us it's very good, and you've told us some of the things that you do, what have you learnt about disability and attitudes towards disability in Australia? Attitudes towards disability are all right. For physical disability, I think the attitudes are a lot better. I do know there are certain sectors, I'm guessing in every community, where the intellectual disability, I don't know. I've seen people mock other people, and I think it's really sad. But the attitudes towards disability in general are very positive. Lots of people in dis with the disability contribute to their society in many different ways. We're always helping out, doing what we can. Quite a lot of people who listen to my podcasts are themselves visually impaired, and I'm sure they'll be interested to know this. What are the prospects for blind people in Australia in terms of work and education? Where my brother used to work at BHP Billiton, he was an engineer there. There were quite a few blind people working there. Some as lawyers, not too sure what other roles they had, but another friend of mine who worked at a major rail company also had a lot of people in their Brisbane office with vision impairment or blindness or even any form of disability working there. So I would say there's a lot of job aspects and prospects for people with vision impairment and blindness within Australia. And what help do disabled people generally receive in Australia with finance and things like that? We've heard about NDIS and you've referred to it. So talk us through what help somebody like you would get from the government in Australia. So for myself, I get help with 
carers to clean my house, to take me shopping. When I go to Brisbane for work, they'd come with me. I actually was able to get an upgraded JAWS program for my computer as I need that for my work. I'm also very lucky where I have really adapted to technology. One of the most important things my mum said to me when I was living at home and I was learning JAWS, this is back in 2005 or six after my accident, she said to me she was glad that I was keeping up with technology. As she said, even with JAWS, you were able to see the news, you're able to email your friends. She said, I don't know how you would do that without JAWS in your situation. And then when I got an iPhone in 2012 and I was showing my mum and dad around it, mum said the same thing again to me. She said, I'm glad you've kept up with technology as it has increased your independence and increased your quality of life as you're able to keep in touch with friends everywhere. The unfortunate thing is I used to help out a lot of vision impaired people throughout the state I live in. There are some factors of the vision impaired community that don't jump on board with technology. They just immediately assume it's too hard. It's quite sad and unfortunate. I've offered free tutoring classes with JAWS and the voiceover program on my iPhone to many people, but they just see it as too hard. In terms of friends, Dave, you mentioned there about keeping in touch with people using technology. Just wondered, are you still in touch with the people that you were friends with before your accident? A couple of friends of mine that I were climbing with were very shocked when I had my accident, but they are still friends with me. Jake, my best friend, was a climber. He wasn't there on the day. He is now living on Thursday Island. He visited me a few months ago when he was in Mackay. I get to catch up with him all the time. I catch up with another climbing friend of mine, Danny, who lives in New Zealand. Yeah, their attitudes have always been very positive towards me. It was really nice. Another friend, um, Huey, they had a housewarming party. And this is while I was still in hospital, sorry, in the spine unit. They come and pick me up with my mum. Mum taught them how to help me into the car and help me out. And they took me to the party. Then they dropped mum back at where she was staying. And I was able to join in the party celebrations, which was just a normal thing for me. It was really nice. And then they take, took me back to the spawn unit when I was ready for it. Those, they're really great guys. I'm just thinking about before the accident again, Dave, had you ever contemplated disability? Was it something you knew anything about? No and no. I didn't really contemplate disability. And no, I didn't know much about disability. I knew, I'm going to say some, as I used to help out a couple of people at school that had some sort of challenges. So moving forward then to now, what have you learned about yourself since the accident? I have grown in different ways that I would never imagined. I've experienced things I thought I would never have dreamed of in different ways. I've been open to different opportunities. Yeah, life's great. Just take one day at a time and do the best I can. And one of the things that you do is art. Tell me about that because that's been very important to you. So I'm an artist. My art sort of started when I was in the spawning unit as my occupational therapist went away and the relief OT didn't like the kitchen because there was this big wall that had nothing on it. So I brought a big flat piece of timber and me and another lady I helped design the drawing, sorry, the painting, and then I helped paint the background. It's basically a painting of a wheelchair and these lines coming off the spokes. The lines all have words on them. The big wheel is out of hospital support. So like my family, my friends, my beliefs. The small wheel has words for in hospital support like doctors, nurses, physios, all those type of things. 
and being able to sketch with a text and a piece of paper made me realize oh wow this is cool because at that point I could probably see about a couple of meters in front of me just in black and white and my mum brought a permanent marker and a A3 drawing pad and I sort of sketched some landscapes like some palm trees and some beach scenes and that then grew into when I was living at home I started studying again I was studying environmental sciences I didn't go back to that because as a science expert aspect sorry I changed to a uh, bachelor of society and the environment so more social studies and environmental management so while I was studying I started charcoal drawing after about two and a half years I started to see some colors again so I started color pastel drawings then I moved to a place called Paravilla it was a transition place where I could build up more skills did some charcoal drawings there that all went on the wayside because I graduated from university and started working worked for about three years and then my contract at the Department of Environment didn't get renewed. So a friend of mine who I knew through hospital actually visited and inspired me to paint because she loved my drawings. And until then, I had always overthought painting. I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to get it everywhere. Well, when you stop overthinking and start doing, it turns out, no, I don't get it everywhere. I do quite a good job with it. So the painting has turned into quite a business for me. About three weeks ago, I painted my 1000th painting. So I paint a lot of abstract paintings, a landscape painting, seascape paintings. I do a lot in bright colors as I can see them more. I really enjoy it. I get a lot out of it. It is a hobby. It does help me out in a different way. As I have a spinal injury, I also have chronic pain. It's called neuropathic nerve pain. And some days it feels like ants crawling on my feet. Some days it feels like my legs are on fire. I cannot take medication for that. So I have my art and it's a hobby that I really enjoy. And your art has been displayed, I think I'm right in saying, is it at the Crossroads Art Centre in Queensland? Ah, uh, yes. We, I had an exhibition there earlier in the year. So Crossroad Arts is an organisation for people with a disability and art. They do a lot of theatre and performance. I had an art exhibition there. Another friend of mine's having an exhibition there soon. I've had an exhibition in Brisbane at an organisation that I can't remember the name of, of course. I've had a few exhibitions over the time. It's really nice. I just like to show my art to people. And Dave, if I can ask you finally then, what does the future hold for you um, as you contemplate um, the future? What are you hoping to do? What are you hoping to achieve? Well, the future for me is very positive. I see myself helping out the community, helping out the world in many ways. I'll continue with my art. I have to mention my mum helped me come up with my art name. It's called Art from the Blind Side. It's just a play on words because it's got to be different. I see myself continuing with my art, continuing with my community work and just living the best life as I can. Well, Dave, it's been fascinating to hear your story and thanks so much for sharing it with us. Thank you so much, Tom. OK, at the start of the podcast, I promised you a track with a familiar voice. Well, here it is. This is Disconnect by The Vow featuring Tom Walker. Not that one. Politics is finished. It comes as no surprise that it's all kicking off. Whether it's dodgy politicians lying in their own pockets or governments doing dodgy deals with corrupt regimes, corruption is everywhere. Oppress the oppressor. Kill the dictator. Oppress the oppressor.
disconnect from you I disconnect from you The radio is beyond redemption The television will not be revolutionized The radio is beyond redemption The television will not to think we're an example to the rest of the world. The only way ordinary people have to get their voices heard is to shout out loud. There's so much anger in the world. We really do live in the age of rage.